So today's passage has a lot of God getting mad at Moses and one of the weirdest stories in the book of Exodus. And we're also going to be combining this with what I think is one of the scariest verses in the Bible where Jesus basically says, if you do this thing, go kill yourself, which I realize is it sounds super sacrilegious to say it that way, but we're gonna talk about that more as uh, towards the end of the video. We are gonna be covering most of the second half of Exodus chapter four, the playlist of the other episodes of this Exodus study are in the description, blah, 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 you know the drill at this point, let's just get to the passage. So up to verse 14, uh, Moses is still talking to the burning bush. He said three miracles performed in front of him. His staff you know, becomes a snake, then becomes a staff again. His hand became leprous and then is healed again. And then he's told that if he takes water from the Nile, pours it out on the ground, it'll turn to blood. Now, after this, Moses says that he's not eloquent and wants God to send someone else. So verse 14, it starts by saying that the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Now, why is this? It should be fairly obvious. Moses, again, begs God, essentially saying, please send anyone else but me. He has no more excuses, no more hypothetical questions, and God becomes angry with him. Why? He's been given evidence that God would be with him and that God would give him the strength to carry out this monumental task. Amidst even this anger with Moses, however, he mercifully provides the option of using Aaron as Moses' mouthpiece. This has a lot more significance than just having his brother as a sidekick. One of the consequences of Moses' reluctance is the priesthood of Levi, or the leadership of the priesthood of Levi, was passed to Aaron and his descendants and not Moses. And we see this in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, where it says the sons of Amram were Aaron and Moses. And Aaron was set apart to sanctify him as most holy, he and his sons forever to burn incense before the Lord, to minister him and to bless his name forever. What's interesting is that in Exodus chapter four, it actually refers to Aaron as the Levite as opposed to a Levite. And most commentators believe that this implies what would happen to Aaron's household as they would leave the Levites. From this, we see that God doesn't need Moses and, and he doesn't need us either. He can find someone else and you, you'll suffer the consequences if that happens. Um, and this could include, you know, losing some heavenly reward or some kind of earthly punishment or even a combination of the two. So what exactly are heavenly rewards? Jesus actually speaks of heavenly rewards multiple times. For example, in Matthew chapter five, he says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you now heavenly rewards are not to be confused with salvation they're very different there are also some who mistakenly think that these rewards are material possessions like you get a, a big mansion or maybe some extra gold or something silly like that the bible doesn't actually give many details as to what these heavenly rewards are but we do know that they glorify god there are also crowns that are spoken of but that's different than what we're talking about here however if when we think of heaven receiving some kind of material possession is the thing that's most looked forward to this should be a, a pretty significant concern because as christians the greatest reason we look forward to to be in heaven is to be with god to see him and, and be with him forever some believe that you cannot lose heavenly rewards. And the passage that's often quoted is Matthew chapter 10, where it says, And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is my disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now, what we learn from James is that if we don't do what is right, we are in sin. Or in other words, if you know the good that you're supposed to do and you don't do it, that's sin. Sin isn't just to do wrong, it's the absence of doing what is right. Likewise, if you sin, not only do you not gain the reward that you would have gotten if you had obeyed, you lose reward since that lack of obedience is sin. This is what it means when it says, you will by no means lose your reward. You don't lose it because you were obedient in the first place. We lose rewards because we aren't kind to followers of God and helping fellow believers in need. We don't lose it when the opposite is true. First Corinthians chapter three says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, we start with the foundation, which is Christ, and then build off of that. And then in verse 12, it reads, now if anyone builds on the foundation, again, building off of Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive the reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. It says that if your works not stand the test of fire, but are burned up, you will suffer loss. 
you'll still be saved since we're all building off of Christ. So this, again, isn't a salvation that we're talking about. But what does it mean to suffer loss exactly? So it's interesting as Catholics actually think that this fire is purgatory. However, there's no such mention or even an inference of purgatory in this passage. It's hard to say what suffering loss is since God will wipe away every tear and there's no pain in heaven. So perhaps it means that, you know, somebody who suffers loss is able to glorify God to the same extent that another person does. But... This is just conjecture. We don't really know for sure what it is, only what it isn't, <clears throat> purgatory. You should want to obey God regardless of what these heavenly rewards are, since as Christians, we're supposed to love God, and through that, we obey him and abide in him. Um, if we do that, we don't have to worry about it so much. So one of my favorite books in the Old Testament has got to be the prophet Jeremiah. And in that book, we see where Jeremiah is called to be a prophet. We see an earthly punishment for rejecting God's call. And this is laid out very clearly. God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. You shall go and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. I'm sure many of you have heard that quote many, many times, but what we don't often hear quoted is verse 17, where God warns Jeremiah saying, but you dress yourself for work, arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. God says that if Jeremiah was dismayed by his enemies, God himself would dismay Jeremiah. He later promises in verse 19 that they will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. God also promises a fight, but he also promised him deliverance. This story of Jeremiah, and even now where we're at in Exodus, Moses rejecting God's commission, should provide us some healthy fear of God in all of us. I know it does for me. But it should also provide some level of encouragement. Why is this? Because God was still patient with Moses and used Moses to do amazing things. This is largely because Moses did eventually repent and obey God. And we make mistakes. But if we repent and ask God to use us, he certainly can. And he's patient. One commentator put it, This event teaches us that those who decline the labor and hazard connected with the call of God to a special service may thereby forfeit and forego a blessing of which they little dream. So God offers this merciful solution solution to Moses in having Aaron come and speak for him. And what's interesting about this is that God says Aaron was already coming out to meet Moses and that Aaron would be glad to see him. We see that God in his omniscience had the foreknowledge that Moses would be reluctant to his obedience. But this is very different than God predetermining or causing Moses to have his reluctance. Rather, he knew what Moses would do before Moses himself chose to do that. And with that knowledge sent Aaron on his way. God says that he would be with the mouth of both Moses and Aaron. He then tells Moses that Aaron would be his mouthpiece and Moses would perform the signs. This then ends Moses' encounter at the burning bush. And after this, Moses returns to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he asks his permission to return to Egypt. However, Moses doesn't disclose the full picture of what will take place in Egypt. He doesn't tell him that he's going to go to set the Hebrew captives free. Rather, he states that he wants to see how they're getting along or how they're doing, which is true. But again, this doesn't disclose the full picture. And many of the ancient Jewish commentators lean towards this being some kind of act of modesty, while Calvin chalked it up to male reluctance to talk about spiritual things with other men. But regardless of the reason, he didn't need to get Jethro's permission since he was commissioned directly by God and did this merely out of courtesy or respect of his father-in-law, which isn't a bad thing. So Jethro grants his permission, and in the next verse it says that God told Moses that those in Egypt who are seeking his life are dead. With this knowledge and permission from Jethro, Moses begins his journey back to Egypt with his wife and two sons. So in the verses directly following this, God gives Moses a summary of what would happen in the days to come. He tells Moses that wonders will be performed by God's power and that God will harden Pharaoh's heart and that he will not let Israel go. Now, we're going to be covering the, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart at length in, in a future video when we go through the problems of theological determinism. So we're going to shelve that for now, but we'll continue here. So after this, God says, then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. And behold, I will kill your son, 
your firstborn. So the idea that Israel was God's firstborn would have been a huge insult to Pharaoh who viewed himself as a son of the gods. The term firstborn in the Bible can kind of be confusing sometimes as there's a literal meaning, right, where the person is the oldest child, but it can also have a figurative meaning where it's first in rank, sort of like the birthright that Jacob received. This privilege goes back to the seed of Abraham where God promises to bless his descendants. And God later declared the line of the Messiah from the line of David as his firstborn. And even Christ himself is referred to as the firstborn on multiple occasions. Additionally, the author of Hebrew also says that all believers are in God's firstborn. Confused yet? That's okay. The meaning of firstborn in each of these verses is actually slightly different, but none of them take this sort of literalistic approach in that they're the oldest child, so to speak. To go through each of them would take too much time, and so we're not going to do that today, but when you go through and, and come across this firstborn term yourselves, I would encourage you to look it up. And if you do, you'll find the passage is much more rich than you may have previously thought. Now, God says he will rescue his firstborn, but he also predicts that Pharaoh will refuse to let his children leave and that God himself will kill Pharaoh's firstborn. Now, there's a lot to talk about with this plague. We're going to talk about it when we get to the plagues, and so we're gonna shelf that one for, for now as well. This brings us to the bridegroom of blood story. Verse 24 begins, Now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Well, that escalated quickly. Then in verse 25, it says, Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin, threw it at Moses' feet, and she said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. And at the time she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So. God meets Moses along his journey to Egypt and wants to put Moses to death. When it says this, it could mean that there was an angel of the Lord or the angel of the Lord before him with a drawn sword, or it could mean Moses was afflicted with some perilously alarming and deadly disease. But why would God try to kill Moses? After all, he's doing what God told him in going to Egypt, finally. So there are two potential reasons. The first reason is that Potentially, they are delaying this journey at the lodging place, thus demonstrating more reluctance on the part of Moses. This is possible, but I don't think it should be considered as the only reason because of how the crisis was averted. So the second reason is a little bit more complicated and has to do with the circumcision that took place. We don't know which child this circumcision happened to, but we do know that he wasn't circumcised. Given the context of this passage, you know, coming after God talking about Israel as his firstborn and how he'll punish Pharaoh by killing his firstborn, it may be that this is a story about Moses' firstborn. This is also the first time we hear any dialogue from Zipporah, Moses' wife. But why did she circumcise Moses' child when that was usually done by a priest later on or by a patriarchal figure like Abraham or in the New Testament even uh, Paul in the case of Timothy? It's possible that his wife objected to the practice of circumcision, which is why Moses' son wasn't circumcised. But regardless of whether she was partially responsible for the lack of circumcision or not, she tells Moses essentially, if I had not been married to you, I wouldn't have to do this disgusting and bloody thing to my son. Now, why did God take this lack of circumcision so seriously? To understand this, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 17, where God blesses Abraham and says that out of his line will come nations, kings, and and prosperity in the land that God would give him. To partake in this covenant or promise, though, God gives a condition. Every male was to be circumcised on the eighth day. This would provide a physical sign of this covenant. And this is why Gentiles are called the uncircumcision, and the descendants of Abraham were called the circumcision in the New Testament. Scripture also uses the term uncircumcision in a figurative or spiritual sense to describe those who fail to both hear and love and obey the Lord in descriptions of uncircumcised ears or uncircumcised hearts. So there are medical benefits to circumcision, but that's not why it's prescribed, at least not explicitly for this reason. And we need to be really careful about turning scripture into a medical encyclopedia when it definitely wasn't intended to be so. There are a few exceptions to this, but as a general rule, the Bible is not a medical encyclopedia. So Moses not circumcising his child tells us a couple things. It could be that he felt cut off from the people of Israel, which is why he didn't circumcise his child. This is very significant because it shows a lack of faith and belief in the covenant that God made with Abraham, his forefather. Now, it could also be that even if Moses desired to circumcise his children, his wife could have opposed it. It could have been a source of marital tension, so he neglected to do it. 
But regardless of his reasoning or his wife's involvement, Moses was held personally responsible for this, and it nearly cost him his life. Years of preparation in the Egyptian court, years of preparation in the deserts of Midian were at the brink of just being cast aside. Thus, we learn that Moses' preparation should have included his family. He should have been leading his family spiritually, not as some familial pope, but as a spiritual head under God. Paul gives very serious warnings on this in 1 Timothy, where we see that any father who refuses to provide for his family, both physically and spiritually, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Worse than an unbeliever. Jesus actually takes it one step further in Matthew chapter 18 saying, and whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned into the depths of the sea. Here, Jesus says rather hyperbolically, if you cause these children to stumble spiritually and to sin, go kill yourself. Think about that for a second. Then in the next verse, he continues this thought saying, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it's inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the man through whom the stumbling block comes. Now, obviously Jesus isn't approving of suicide. He isn't saying that you should kill yourself because actually if you do this, you become a stumbling block again because you've murdered yourself. And so by becoming a stumbling block again, you have to kill yourself a second time. So the Bible's clear that suicide is wrong. But what he is saying is that we need to take great care in our spiritual nurturing of children, especially our own children. We need to take it very seriously. Being a parent is, is a huge honor. It's, it's a kind of a scary thing, uh, but it's also a huge blessing and it should be celebrated as demonstrated in many other places in scripture, like the apostle John, where he says he has no greater joy than to hear his children are walking in the truth. Now, this could be his spiritual children, but the point remains the same. The Bible's exceptionally clear on the importance and the blessing of children. But if you try to corrupt them for your own desires, there are severe punishments. There are so many voices right now that try to corrupt children, whether that's sexually, intellectually, emotionally, from allegedly family-friendly companies like Disney promoting homosexual propaganda to others in like public educators that are trying to convince masculine women or feminine men to mutilate themselves. All the while, billions of people who are allegedly Christian approve of those who conduct abortions in our modern day child sacrifice to the narcissistic God of self. There will be severe consequences for this and those who support them who do these things, including financial support. And the church needs to take this way more seriously than it has. Most churches are way too comfortable and way too apathetic about where the culture is and where it's going. Now, I was, I'm going to tell a story for a second here. I was joking with uh, one of the pastors at my church, and uh, they had a men's retreat that was going on. It had recently happened, and, and church retreats are great. This is nothing to say. Uh, to that. But I told him, why are we always going on church retreats? We should be hosting a church advance. Now, again, the reality is the church is that I go to is a beacon of light, and it's really strong in this area. But the joke and the point remains, we are in a spiritual war. We are ambassadors in enemy territory, and it's time we started acting like it. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to prepare your children to be a light? If you don't have children, what are you going to do to prepare for when you do? What are you going to do to stand for children that have no voice? Or are you instead going to sit in lazy apathy while your brothers and sisters go to war with the kingdom of darkness? With that, I would like to conclude with a few thoughts from one of my favorite sermons of all time. So enjoy. Every true Christian is a soldier. The otherwise Christian is a chocolate Christian, dissolving in water and melting at the smell of fire. God never was a chocolate manufacturer, and he never will be. God's men are always heroes, and in scripture you can trace their giant foot tracks down the sands of time. Abraham, a simple farmer at the word of the invisible God, marched with family and stock through the terrible desert to a distant land to live among a people whose language he could neither speak nor understand. Not bad that. But later he did even better, marching hot foot against the combined armies of five kings flushed with recent victory to rescue one man. His army, just 318 odd fellows armed like a circus crowd. And he won too, only a farmer, no war training. His open secret, he was the friend of God. David, a man after God's own heart, 
was a man of war and a mighty man of valor. When all Israel were on the run, David faced Goliath alone but with God. And he was well scolded by his brother Eliab for having come to see the battle. What a splendid fool his brother must have been, as though David would go to see a battle and not stay to fight. They are chocolate soldiers who merely go to see battles and coolly urge others to fight them. And so the tale goes on. Go where you will, through the scriptures or history, you will find that the men who really knew God and didn't merely say they did were invariably paragons of pluck, daredevil desperados for Jesus, gamblers for God. Fools and madmen shout the world and the chocolate. The ten spies were chocolates. They melted and ran over the whole congregation of Israel, turning them into chocolate cream, softies, afraid to face the fire and water before them. God put them all in a saucepan and boiled them for 40 years in the desert and left them there. He has no use for chocolates. Difficulties, dangers, disease, death, or divisions don't deter any but the chocolates from executing God's will. When someone says there's a lion in the way, the real Christian promptly replies, that's hardly enough inducement for me. Besides, I want at least a bear or two to make it worth my while. Real Christians revel in desperate ventures for Christ, expecting from God great things and attempting the same with exhilaration. We Christians often substitute prayer for playing the game. Prayer is good, but when it's a substitute for obedience, it's nothing but a blatant hypocrisy, a despicable Phariseeism. Will you fear or will you fight? Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? To your knees, man, and to your Bible. Decide at once. Don't hedge. Time flies. Cease your insults to God. Quit consulting flesh and blood. Stop your lame, lying, and cowardly excuses. This is my final advice to you, so listen carefully. One, if you don't desire to meet the devil during the day, meet Jesus before dawn. Two, if you don't want the devil to hit you, hit him first with all your might so that he may be too crippled to hit back. Preach the word is the rod the devil fears and hates. Three, if you don't want to fall, walk and walk straight and fast. Four, three of the devil's dogs which he used to hunt us is a swollen head, laziness and lust. Learn to scorn the praise of man. Learn to lose with God. Jesus won the world through shame and beckons us to his road.